Okay, good. Um, so I'm at an HTML5 conference. And uh, I wanted to see how many boos I get for this. <laughs> wow, you guys are so polite. I was expecting uh, to be kicked out for having this slide here. Uh, well, yeah, it always depends. So certainly uh, that's uh, the talk of my talk. Um, but yeah, first, uh, this is about native at an HTML5 conference. And so, you know, my uh, stereotype or image is that everything needs to be in the web browser. And um, so when I was told, you're going to talk at an HTML5 conference about native development, you know, I was, uh-oh. And these are the words I was expecting to hear. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> But you know, I, I you know, so. But you know, we're actually using JavaScript, and uh, maybe I need to elaborate on this point. Our thing is, we basically write a lot of backend engine stuff in native languages, and then we expose a binding to JavaScript, so you, the game developers, can actually write in JavaScript and not have to worry about the native side. Now. Um, Node.js no and other technologies seem to get a pass, but sometimes when I bring this up with uh, you know, HTML5 people, it's sort of, no, why don't you just do everything in HTML5? But let me turn the tables on you. So in here, everything is about HTML5, everything is about in the browser. The moment we step out these doors, nobody's ever heard of JavaScript in the game industry. So the video game industry has its very different ecosystem. And JavaScript isn't even on the map. You might count Flash as uh, the one singular blip where JavaScript like gets attention, but I don't know how you feel about you know, uh, Flash and uh, the relationship with uh, JavaScript. But now even Flash is on the decline, so it's really not um, even relevant anymore. This is a survey from 2009 about what scripting languages do you use in your games. Now. I was looking for more recent ones and older ones. This is the best one I found that was as close as to recent as I could find. But I've seen these things through the years, even as far back when I first learned about Lua back in 2002-ish. And these results are pretty much the same. Nothing really seems to change um, just with general language usage um, in any um, um, chart. And so you can see that Lua is the de facto standard in the game industry. And it's better than a coin flip that they're using Lua. And what's interesting is if they're not using Lua, they'd rather invent their own language. <laughs> and, um, and you can see from this chart, there seems to be a language that's very relevant to this talk that's missing. So <clears throat> in addition, um, HTML5 browsers, gaming really isn't the thing. So gamers are used to launching individual apps. And the iOS and App Store ecosystem has really swung the pendulum back to native apps when you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, everything was moving to the browser. But in the gamer world, I mean, gamers have always been used to con con um, cartridges and CDs and DVDs. So they're not put off by the fact that they have to do something different to launch their game. And then we have Steam. And they really you know, made downloading games popular. And they don't do it through a web browser. So <clears throat> I was perceived I'd be the enemy, but I'm going to suggest maybe I'm your ally. Because how long, often do you get to talk to a person who's from the video game industry, who likes scripting, and will give you a fair assessment of what's going on um, in the game industry, rather than just telling you what you want to hear? So next question is, why should you listen to me? So let me give you a little bit about the background. Um, <clears throat> these are some of my gamer credentials. Um, I've been a user and contributor to the SDL project. Sorry. And um, SDL is a middleware library that um, is cross-platform and basically gives you all the infrastructure you need to build games on different platforms. And what's really exciting is um, it's now just been adopted by Valve um, the lead uh, programmer um, has been hired, and they are using it as a foundation technology in the upcoming um, Steam OS and Steam machines, and basically porting your games to Linux. Um, I've also been a contributor um, to OpenScene Graph, which is a 
a layer library on top of OpenGL. Um, I have co-authored the book, Beginning in iPhone Games Development, and um, I took it also as an opportunity to write the most comprehensive resource in OpenAL ever done. And then I also have my own open source library called AL Mixer that's built on top of OpenAL to make um, using OpenAL a little more easy. But do I have any scripting cred? So way, way back, um, I was at Sun Microsystems for a brief while, and I learned Java and Perl. Well, everyone expected me to think, oh, Java is like the greatest thing since sliced bread, but we found that Perl is actually the more useful of the set. So at the time, client side just really wasn't there. JavaScript was just emerging. We were trying to do Java applets, which were just emerging, and that was terrible. We ended up doing everything through CGI scripts, and Perl was amazing. We could do so much work um, so quickly in Perl. Um, it was just, I, I became a big proponent of scripting. Fast forward a few years later, I worked on um, the Global Star Project at Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm. And we were building a global communication satellite system, with, um, launching satellites into orbit, and um, basically making it so you, you could talk through a phone anywhere in the world. And we were using Perl. Now, think about this for a second. This is in the 90s, and back then, nobody was using scripting languages. And we were told we were nuts, and you can't use scripting languages for real work. And here we are building rockets and satellites and launching them in orbit and making everyone connect it using Perl. So I totally get why you love JavaScript and why you want to use scripting languages and why they're awesome. Um, but also, I'm, you might understand why I don't get really, really excited when somebody ports some new app to you know, the work in the web browser. So then I transitioned to scientific visualization and games. Um, I love Perl, but I uh, couldn't use them in games, basically. So where's the performance? I can't access the native features. Windows Perl and you know, Unix Perl don't work exactly the same way. And then making p users install CPAN to get all my modules just doesn't really work. And these problems should sound pretty familiar. So I looked to the game industry. How did they actually solve this? And, well, it was Lua, of course, even way back then. So I don't know how many people have actually heard of Lua here. Oh, wow, I am, like, shocked. Okay, so um, how many of you are game developers, actually? Okay, maybe that, <laughs> that explains it. Um, so um, in the game industry, yeah, Lua is very well known. Outside the game industry, not so much. Um, it started really getting attention from World of Warcraft, which really made it uh, public. Um, I was also doing scientific visualization, and really Mac in the um, last decade was the place to be for that type of stuff, because they had the OpenGL stack and um, the GUI stack and all the components you need to really do scientific visualization, so I became a Mac Cocoa developer. And I wrote, ended up writing a language bridge called Lua Cocoa, which automatically bridges the two, two languages together, so you can call in between each one um, just kind of magically. So um, I have a lot of experience with both native and scripting. So now I'm at Atlantica, and we're basically trying to bring those great ideas about scripting and native um, to JavaScript. So we are a mobile centric company right now, um, but all the, the ideas in this talk are really kind of general purpose, though we are very sensitive to mobile performance. So when somebody says, oh, well, this works fine in my browser, meaning desktop browser, we also test the mobile side, and things are usually a very different story there. So quick facts about the game industry. Um, they're actually very pragmatic. Um, they don't really believe in one single technology. They will do anything that it takes to get the job done. And they will use the best tools, plural, um, for the job. And so that means they use native and scripting together. But they're also famous for hacks and clues, and um, they're also very, very secretive. Um, I'm not sure if that's intentional or just because everyone's just so tired. So really, it's not about native versus scripting. It's how do we use them. But I feel compelled that I do need to talk about native since I'm in an HTML5 conference and why we can't do everything in JavaScript. So who cares about performance here? OK, good. Now, I know some people actually don't care about performance because sometimes you don't need it. But when you do, you have to do it. Um, so we have a real world case. Um, so we started with a physics engine. And we started with a pure JavaScript implementation of the um, physics engine. 
And for the same reasons you'd want to do it too. It's easier and it's less time for us. And we really, really wanted this to work. I mean, we didn't want us to have to spend time to build native stuff because we had so much other stuff to do. But when we actually tried it, about you know, 10 objects or something just falling, not doing really anything interesting, um, we started hitting performance problems very early. And we knew we had to roll out a native module. So um, we replaced basically the back end um, with a native physics engine written in C. And um, we created JavaScript bindings to it so we still could uh, write to it using um, all JavaScript in our um, actual app. And then after, it, we, uh, after that, we actually did some benchmarks just so we could get kind of an understanding of what the difference was between um, the JavaScript and native, particularly on our mobile devices. Now, these were not really intent, uh, intended to be formal benchmarks that I was actually intending to show at the world. This was actually most internal use, and then I was planning to do this talk, and so I grabbed the numbers since I had them. Um, so we tested on an iPad mini, a Samsung Galaxy S4, which is an Android device, and then the iOS simulator. Now, iOS uses JavaScript core, and Android uses, uh, our Android uses um, V8. And one other thing is that on iOS, we're not allowed to use JIT, so we had to disable it. Now, um, you can see that native, in all cases, was much faster. So the column on the right, um, that 41x, I'm not missing a decimal point there. It is actually 41 times faster in native. Um, that's huge. And I forgot a couple of things. So I forgot to actually turn on optimizations in the compile for iOS, so the iOS side actually might be a little faster. Um, also interesting is the S4 hardware is actually more powerful than the iPad mini in terms of hardware. Now you see that in the native uh, versus native performance. But in the JavaScript versus JavaScript performance, what we see is the Android one was actually slower, um, 2.5 times slower. And on top of that, this is with JIT on versus J JIT off. So all those magical promises about how, JIT, how fast JIT can be, we didn't see any of that. In fact, um, we can't turn off JIT on V8, but I would have tried if we could have. So, uh, let me take you down into the nitty gritty of uh, performance. And here, like on the internet, you'll see a lot of very high level talks about JITs and compilers and all this voodoo and magic that they do for you and which one's better because their thing is going to be better next week. And <clears throat> it's not very helpful in my opinion. So I really want to talk about some fundamental things. I don't have time though. I talk about all of them, so I'm going to focus on one. Memory, and this is really kind of the elephant in the room for performance. So ever since 1980, uh, CPU and memory um, bus speeds, or um, performance speeds have uh, um, diverged. So the CPUs have gotten very, very fast, but the memory buses that connect them to the main memory have not kept up. And the differential between the two has just gotten worse and worse over time. So let's zoom in here to look at an actual uh, processor. Um, so you'll see at the bottom, I actually cite a lot of references. I took a lot of slides from different talks. I really like this talk, and I'm actually going to take a few slides from his, um, his talk. Um, Brumer uh, really gets down into, the, he does an excellent talk. He really gets down into the nitty gritty about memory and performance. I highly recommend the talk. Um, his talk is not unique, but what is unique about his talk is he actually talks about solid numbers, which is a little unusual. So in this case, he actually used the Intel Sandy Bridge. Now, we're a mobile company, so our ARM metrics are a little different, but um, you can extrapolate how the Intel Sandy Bridge will um, uh, be uh, very similar to all processors. So uh, basically, we have three levels of cache and main memory. So Cache is very important on a CPU now. And in fact, about 30% of the CPU um, hardware is actually like just cache. And then another 20% is all the infrastructure to deal with the cache. So about 50% of the CPU is all dedicated just to cache because that's how important memory um, performance is. So if we start off on the execution pipelines, um, we basically uh, 
do a bunch of computation, and then when we need the fetch information, we try to grab it from the caches. And if we can't get it from the first cache, go to the second one, then the third one, and then we get the main memory. Now, the question is, well, how fast is that, or how long does that take to fetch um, information from the cache? So I'm just talking about four bytes. So how, how, how many cycles does it take to get four bytes from the L1 cache? Um, anyone want to hazard guess? Okay, maybe not. Oh yeah, four, yeah. So in four cycles, you can uh, get uh, something from the L1 cache, four bytes. But in four cycles, you can actually do a 32-bit multiply. So in just fetching some information from the cache, you can have already done an entire multiplication. Now in the L2 cache, we now jump to 12 cycles. So in the time that it takes to do 12 cycles, you can do a 32-bit square root. Now let's go to the L3 cache. So that's 26 cycles. So in 26 cycles, you can do about two square roots. Now, main memory, anyone want to hazard a guess here? 100, 120 something. No, it's actually a lot worse. Um, actually, we have to use rules of thumbs here. Um, so this is where people say it's basically a coffee break and there are different levels of performance hell when you deal with main memory. Um, so the most obvious one is virtual memory. The moment you hit the disk, you don't know how long you're going to take. But even when you're not hitting disk, there are still a lot of variations and performance concerns. So the physical placement of the chip on like what bank it is can actually have an uh, impact on how fast it takes to get to that piece of memory. Now, as a rule of thumb on the consoles, the, seem, uh, the popular number seems to be 600. So an Xbox uh, 360 and a PlayStation 3, you assume 600 cycles just to get um, four bytes of memory back. And in 600 cycles, you can do 150 32-bit multiplies. Now, think about that. Now, a lot of people probably thought to themselves, oh, well, I've done this computation, and I want to save it um, in a variable. And um, that way I don't have to like waste time recomputing it later. Well, at 600 cycles, maybe you need to rethink that because that is a lot of processing power wasted just waiting for memory to come back. So memory layout is also very important to performance. And so what the slide shows is we have um, tight inner loop and we're um, jumping through arrays trying to fetch data. Now, CPUs um, generally implement something called prefetching, where they try to get a big block of memory instead of just the four bytes you request it, because they're trying to anticipate that you're probably going to need the memory around it as well. But if you don't structure your memory layout correctly, you force the processor to jump, and the prefetch doesn't help you. And so in this case, um, the memory has to jump around um, in the K and J loop. And you see in the little picture down there that um, the memory is not contiguous, and so we basically have a lot of coffee breaks to get to main memory. So just flipping the two loops around basically gives us contiguous memory access. And um, in um, Broomer's uh, profile, he saw a 10x speed up on his Intel CPU. Now what's interesting is the Intel CPU is actually very good with bad code. So Intel spends a lot of time optimizing for code that's actually not optimized. If you have a bad processor or a cheap processor like you find on a mobile device, your 10x speed up is probably going to be a lot, lot more. Um, this is very similar to the last uh, slide. This is um, one you can do at home. Um, basically, it's just a for loop, but the major difference is uh, incrementing by 1 versus incrementing by 16. And if you try this on your little laptop or you know, whatever you have, you'll see that the top one always wins by a lot. But data structure memory layout also has a big impact. So this is a C++ class. And what this picture is basically trying to show is that how you organize your class member variables impacts uh, the memory performance. Because when you fetch a piece of memory, um, say at the top, the M position, and then you also have to use something down further um, it may have not been pulled with the prefetching. And so now, every time you pull one of those member variables, um, you keep getting a cache miss, 
and you basically keep having to go back to main memory. So if you use the wrong layout or even the wrong language features, um, this slide doesn't show up, but if you use things like virtual um, methods and stuff like that, that will also usually work against you in performance. So this slide basically, he rearranged the class structure and OOD, this gets a little more um, into specific uh, optimization strategies on the native side, but there's a, uh, OOD refers to object-oriented design. Um, there is a movement called data-oriented design that basically is highly critical of the former, which you've probably, you're probably familiar with object-oriented design in some level. Data-oriented design is, it's a fairly, it's a niche thing, um, but it's gaining a lot of traction because they're pretty much right. And you can see that from the object-oriented design, because they did not organize their layout correctly, um, they basically have to do 7,680 cycles because um, each part of that operation is a cache miss, and they basically always have to uh, fetch main memory for each um, iteration of the loop, which happens four times. When they reorganize the data in data-oriented design, they only take the memory hit once, and the number of cycles goes down to 1,980. So one interesting point here, um, if you're kind of an independent observer, is that native, language actually, native languages are not actually helpful here. So some people tell you, oh yeah, the native languages are great, but they're not actually helping us. So they're not telling us, or they're not automatically telling us what the memory layout should be. They're not telling us where these cache misses are. And pretty much the only way to do this is you need experience, you need to run profilers, and you need to manually tune. Now, and there are also debates like data-oriented design versus object-oriented design within the whole community. But the reason we use native languages is even though they don't help, they do at least allow us to control this. So we can kind of work around the problems even if the tools aren't really helping us. So back in JavaScript. So let's take a look at a, you know, some kind of casual code here. So we have this little you know, simple function call that's nested in some namespace. And that little dot operator there is a hash lookup every single time. And now from algorithms class, you say, well, that's O1, and that should be fast. But what did we just see about memory? We have a 600 cycle lookup every time we um, have to go to main memory. So O1 is algorithmically fast, but it's not necessarily real world fast. And in fact, um, I would suggest that an ON algorithm, where you basically put everything into an array, is often much faster, particularly in game programming. Because what ON in computer science really talks about is N, where N is like theoretically very, 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 very large. In game programming, you have, what, 100 objects, 1,000 objects, maybe 10,000 objects. For computer science, that's tiny. So <clears throat> that's a lot of performance put on the floor. Um, so what if we create an object in our JavaScript? So let's create a vec object, and basically my question is, well, what's the memory layout there? So we had to spend a lot of time on the native side to figure out what the optimal memory layout is. Can we even control this in JavaScript? And the answer is no, we can't really, but we're not supposed to, and that's really, I think, a good thing, because that's the thing that really kind of makes JavaScript fun and easy and approachable, and why would we want to give up those things? So. Rather than trying to do everything from JavaScript, why don't we you know, use the best of both worlds, use the right tool for the right job, and use both of them? And more than a wrench just uh, goes in a toolbox. So um, I feel compelled to also talk about some of the you know, common uh, you know, uh, ideas about, well, things are improving. We don't, we, at some point, we're not going to have to deal with native. We can do everything in JavaScript. So performance keeps improving. So. Um, I like this cartoon. So as you can see, by the late next month, you'll have over four dozen husbands. Better get a bulk rate on the wedding cake. But how about JavaScript is catching up to native? So the middle panel here, I think, uh, answers that. Are we catching up to where they will be in a year, which is unknowable, or where they are now, which is stupid? Um, I'm curious if. Uh, People here saw this article. It got a lot of attention. You see one um, during, over the summer. Um, I think it was on Hacker News. It was on Slashdot. It was on uh, Reddit, I think. 
Um, this is a very controversial thing about why mobile apps are slow, and he put a lot of de detail on this, and I actually liked the article very much. Um, I think it's worth a read. Um, the reason I bring it up is I wanted a couple of his uh, benchmarks. Um, so to answer the question about is JavaScript improving, um, the answer is yes, um, it is getting faster. But with the Sun Spider benchmark here, or I'm sorry, yeah, um, we see from 2010 to 2013, it, it got faster in most cases, but not a lot faster. And so I think what this means is the easy gains are done. Um, so I think there was a criticism also, so he didn't benchmark all of them, so he read the benchmarks on this one. And um, they said, yeah, well, look, it's much, much faster in this case, so the, you know, the curve is still on our side. But um, if you go back to our benchmark that we did at the beginning of this talk, well, they had a really long way to go to begin with. They were, you know, 41 times slower than native. So they should, or they better, you know, increase their speed a lot more because they are that far behind. And then nobody really does a lot of benchmarks on mobile. So that little red line with the iPhone is, oh yeah, we got we to put in iPhone because that's kind of relevant and its performance is pretty terrible. And yeah, kind of a required slide about ASMJS. I think it's interesting. I think it's also a little too early to tell. We're going to have all of those problems about are all the major browsers going to adopt it? Um, are all the optimization points that um, are in there today going to work the same for all the different browsers? So is, if you do one performance optimization for one browser, is it going to um, uh, work to the detriment of another one? And then the way it works now is you write native code and then you get the Inscriptum compiler and it converts it to JavaScript. Well, from my vantage point is I already wrote the native code. Why do I want to give up a magnitude or more performance um, just to put it in JavaScript when I can keep the performance and I've already done all the hard work. Um, so we wanted to put a demo together of our uh, physics engine. Um, uh, let me uh, do a little setup here. So originally, our, our first physics engine, we couldn't even get you know, 10 following blocks to work without a lot of problems. Here, we said, OK, well, we want you to do something a little fancier just to experiment with. So he said, I want to try buoyancy. And um, so we added some buoyancy just to see how it worked. We didn't really do this as a stress test. We just said, go at it, do what you want to do, have fun with it, and um, tell us how it works. So let me show you the demo here. So we got a little guy. I don't know if you guys have seen the game Limbo, but yeah, we took some inspiration from it. And um, we can trigger some falling blocks. And when they hit the water, there's a buoyancy factor. So the blocks bounce up and down. And um, the jumping mechanic and the gravity for that is actually done by the physics engine as well. So it's just a little nice, simple demo. But it looks really nice. And um, when we asked, or when I asked um, Jonathan, uh, so how is the performance? Um, did you have any problems? Did you have to work any, around anything? Do any really nasty evil hacks? I said, no, I just did what I wanted to do and it worked. And that's really the way it should be. So this was all, all written in JavaScript on his side and we uh, basically just wrote the physics engine on the back end so he didn't have to know about it. So let me uh, go to another topic here um, about native versus uh, scripting. And let me check the time. OK. Um, so how about access to native features? And so a lot of these things, I went to an Apple Tech Talk recently, and they're really pushing Core Motion and iBeacon and MiFi controllers. And um, if you feature those, you, know, you will probably get onto the App Store and get promoted by Apple. So that's why it's on my mind. Um, but looking and preparing for this talk, I found out something about audio. And apparently, audio in HTML5 is actually very bad. And I thought that was interesting because really audio shouldn't be a native feature, but the way it works kind of now, it kind of brings out all the problems with the problem with native features. So in fairness, though, um, audio is actually even hard on native. Um, so Apple is excellent. Um, and you can thank the iPod and iTunes ecosystem because they have a serious investment to make sure audio is excellent on the Apple platform. Windows is good too, so um, you know, obviously they, all the games are there, so um, they've had a lot of experience with dealing with this. Linux, eh, it's kind of a mess really. And then Android, oh, oh. 
it's just, there is a famous bug that's ingrained in my mind. It's if you look up 3434 on the internet, um, that takes you to the infamous latency bug on Android, and it's been there for years, and the thread keeps getting longer and longer. So if native is bad, then HTML5 is, yeah, I'm sorry. Really, it shouldn't be this hard. So on top of the OS challenges, um, now you have to deal with the browser and JavaScript engines challenges. And then all of us, but I think it's worse for HTML5, you have to deal with the patent and royalty challenges as well. So um, first though, um, I, I just wanted to get a sample of HTML5 audio, so I did this on my Mac. And um, I, actually, I don't have an audio thing here, so I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this demo. But um, I, I printed the waveform, and this basically is a program that tries to play for Frere Jaca. They sampled a bunch of piano notes, and they play them um, as time comes in. And um, basically, it wasn't always, and I you know, selectively took the worst part of the recording um, for this uh, talk, but it was pretty easy to get a bad recording. So that's kind of the state of things. Um, but you can see like in the begin near the beginning, there's a part where it just goes completely flat. That's a dropout. So the timing wasn't fast enough or there was some latency in the system where they couldn't even get to that note, so it just completely disappeared. And then when I went to iOS and Android, I couldn't even get the thing to play. Um, let me see if this uh, will play audio. Oops. Yeah, sorry. I don't think that's going to work, but oh, okay. I can try it one more time if I can get the cable plugged in. Sustains also on the notes were not consistent, so it's a pretty lousy, miserable experience. Um, so I'm referring to uh, this uh, website at the bottom. Um, I, I, I'm not really an expert on HTML audio. Um, I've done a lot with audio and native, um, and so I, I kind of read his stuff and it seemed to make sense to me. And then I added a couple of my own concerns. But um, one of the ones that he uh, mentions is his timing and latency, and we actually did see this with our own engine as well. Um, and then he deals with API missing functionality. And then I'm actually concerned about performance and throughput a little bit, which is a little bit tied with the API stuff. And then battery and patents, which is something that I've had to deal a lot with. Um, so first, uh, timing and latency. So audio is hard because it's actually worse than um, the visuals in some respect. So a trained ear can detect uh, about seven milliseconds of latency. Um, in contrast, people say, well, 60 frames a second game is usually fast enough where people can not, no longer perceive. You can, but um, in general, 60 frames a second is where they shoot for. And that's 16.67 milliseconds. So audio has a smaller window of opportunity than, game, uh, um, than the vi uh, video part of the games. Uh, that said, most games, if, as long as you're not doing a musical app, you can get away with 60 frames a second. Um, most people are never going to notice. Now, the bigger problem, though, with JavaScript is set interval and set timeout are just completely unpredictable in the callback times. So you request uh, some time, and maybe it will get back to you, maybe it won't. But um, trying to predict how long that is is a huge window, so it's really hard to do anything uh, with any certainty. And then in the web browser in particular, you may have multiple tabs, multiple windows, or maybe something, somebody did something with multiple contexts in some way I haven't even thought about. And then you still have to deal with the OS layer, which has its own kernel scheduler. And um, Android, this comes up. Linux is a fair scheduling based OS. And I think Apple cheats, and they say, no, audio actually gets a high priority thread, so we make sure we deliver those things. Linux says, no, you have to play fair. And that makes life more difficult for an audio developer. Um, I, API, so. HTML5, one of the criticisms was, well, this API is just too high level. It doesn't do enough. 
but this presents a different problem because a simple API is easy to standardize and it's easy to implement, but it can't do everything, whereas a low-level API um, has a lot of problems with performance because now you're starting to talk about manipulating arrays of bytes because you're going to have to start doing your own mixing. And we know that JavaScript arrays of bytes is not really what the language was optimized for. Um, and then Audi a lot of times deals with background threads. And unfortunately, scripting languages in general are not very good with threads. Um, so I stole another slide, this time from myself. This is from, from my book. Um, this is basically give you a picture of what Apple thinks the audio stack should look like. And mostly what I want to convey here is it's big, it's complicated. There's a lot of APIs in core audio. Um, the way, and there's not, there's not even really redundancy here. Um, basically, every one of these APIs does something. The layers on top are basically convenience APIs built on top of the lower ones, but every time you go up to the convenience API, you lose some ability. So when you design your app, you want to basically figure out, can the highest level API do what I want? If not, I need to drop down. Now, where HTML5 audio it probably is, it roughly is that like very, very top AV foundation box. Um, if you want to do everything, though, you need to be able to get to, say, audio units or audio conversion services, which deals with how to convert um, MP3s to PCM and all these other things. Um, game audio would probably live in that orange open AL box. So everyone has kind of a different need, and trying to create one HTML audio standard, it's going to be hard. Um, talk a little bit about performance really quickly. Um, this uh, little math equation basically just shows you have a one-minute song at 44 kilohertz. Um, all audio equipment is designed to deal with uncompressed data. So you always have to decompress the data when you deal with audio. So when you decompress the data, how much data is that? Well, um, that one minute song is 10 megabytes. So that means you're pushing uh, uh, 176,400 bytes per second per uh, song or a file through um, the system. Now, if you want to mix audio, say you have 10 sound effects going off or 20 sound effect, or 20 explosions or something like that, you then multiply by that number. You have to mix all that in real time. That's a lot of data going through the system. And if you want to do that in JavaScript, you have that much more overhead. I'm going to talk really quickly about patents. Um, this is a mess. Um, so AAC is kind of the predominant format now that everyone wants to use. Um, it's the sequel to MP3. The problem with MP3 was that if you ship a song uh, that's in MP3 format, technically you're required to pay a royalty to the MPEG consortium. Now, a lot of people don't know that, and they ship it anyway, but the MPEG consortium can go after you, and big corporations like you know, EA and um, you know, other game companies, they're very well of that fact. And that's actually why a lot of uh, games use Aug Vorbis. But the mobile um, situations change things because now we have to worry about battery. And Apple, Microsoft, and Android basically fine-tuned a lot of hardware and software to be optimized for their formats. And Aug is usually not, well, Android, um, they did optimize for that, but Microsoft and Apple have not optimized, they don't even support Aug. So uh, basically, we're left with um, no common um, compressed standard. And you see this in the web browsers. So I think uh, is it Firefox or is it Chrome or one of them, they, you know, they do not do AAC. They do not do M3. They do AUG. Or the other ones, they want to do AAC or something else. You know, Windows probably does um, WMA or something. But it's a real mess. And then if you try to get a third-party decoder, they're also patent encumbered. So if you find some open source implementation of AAC, um, they're still subject to patents, so if you use it, you still may have to pay a royalty to the consortium. So it's just a real kind of a mess, and I don't see there's a clear answer for this, particularly in the browser. If you want to support all browsers, you just kind of have to ship different files for everything. With native, we can kind of skirt around some of this by basically saying, well, we don't have to worry about every browser. We're embedding the entire engine. We can, and then we can, on top of that, we can tie in the correct hooks to talk to that system's native decoder, and we will be covered by the patents um, that Apple and Microsoft and Android protect us from. Um, I think HTML audio should and can be better, but I think this is actually an interesting case because it does kind of highlight other features you may want to uh, bring to native, uh, bring into JavaScript to HTML5 through extensions, um, and then you start hitting kind of all these problems again. Um, and then just kind of a quick thing about what we did, uh, since we are native, um, so I'm bringing in my AL Mixer library, 
and um, Platino is our um, game engine um, for Lanica. And we kind of exposed the middle level API, so I'm not yet brave enough to do the really low level API stuff, but um, we're very confident we can do the uh, middle level APIs. Um, to deal with a set interval and set timeout, basically, since we control the, um, the entire engine and the JavaScript interpreter, we can basically fire our own events at our own time, and we don't have to worry about set interval and set timeout as long as they use our APIs instead of those. Um, and then we spent a lot of hard work basically trying to get native decoders on all the platforms, especially Android, because it's freaking, freaking hard. Um, and then just performance, particularly in Android, the, yeah, 3434. So how am I doing for time? Uh, okay, I'm starting to run out, so I'm gonna probably have to skip one section, but I think I have enough time for this one here. Um, so I want to talk about other aspects of native development. So native GUI um, comes up every now and then. So game developers in particular are the worst here. We're the worst defenders. So we always reinvent the GUI and we always do a terrible job. So we make our own buttons, we make our own lists, we make you know, everything, and they usually suck. Buttons, you know, okay, yeah, there's not much in a button. You can usually do your own buttons. And, but the moment you get into list views, table views, um, anything complicated, it is just awful. Um, now, I know HTML5 people are often guilty of this too, though they're nowhere near as bad as us. But um, I wanted to bring this up because they, they do do this. And I think in a lot of cases, this is really the bad way of doing it. Um, Apple and Android have spent a lot of time optimizing and building their um, widgets. And um, we're not leveraging you know, their experience. And then also, um, you know, we miss things like accessibility, and then iOS 7, if anyone's shipped out an HTML5 app where they've written all their own widgets, suddenly you've noticed that your apps no longer look like they belong on iOS 7 because the entire themes have changed out from under you. Um, so um, some context, we actually did this game for, uh, with uh, Disney. Um, they wanted to bring Gardens of Time over to Android, and so we tried to help. And so this is a screenshot. It's a hidden objects game, kind of meets Farmville. And um, so uh, a lot of this is you know, from the game. We have a lot of custom user interface widgets here. And uh, this picture doesn't show the bugs, but there were some. And doesn't show the performance issues either. Um, but I think it made an interesting case study for us. So in this case, we reinvented the wheel, and we did it poorly. Google and um, Apple told us, hey, list views are the hardest widget we, in our libraries. And we didn't listen. We said, oh, we can do it. And well, we did it, and it just kind of sucked. Um, so one of the big problems we actually had was out of memory. Um, out of memory, um, particularly low-end Android devices, um, you just do not have much to play with. And since we're doing everything in OpenGL, which decompresses all the textures and everything needs to be a power of two, we're always upscaling, um, we hit those memory limits very, very fast. Um, in addition, because Disney is such a big uh, client, they can get Google's attention. So they say, promote us. And Google will come back saying, yeah, okay, we'll promote you, but only as long, you know, we have to like your app first. And so basically the pressure is on us to deliver something that's very, very high quality, but also something that meets like Google's own um, self-interest. So they have an interest in promoting their own stuff. And our custom horizontal scroll view didn't meet their expectations. They said, no, we want something much more like, say, the Google Play experience. So we took inspiration from Google Play and said, OK, let's use what they were using. And so we used something called the View Pager. And um, when we did it, we found yeah, the implementation was faster, easier, and better than our custom one. And Google was very, very happy um, that we used it and um, basically finally approved our app. And so this is a little short video from our game, um, so you can see the garden here. Um, this is all game logic here. Um, and then um, he's going to hit the back button, and then we're going to basically bring up the native view pager. And, um, and we actually have some custom elements here and the view pager together. So like uh, some of the buttons on the bottom are actually still custom, but um, all the scrolling stuff and in, stuff inside the um, scrolling parts, and even the flip are actually all native. And so um, using the App Sellers uh, technology, um, it was pretty straightforward for us to basically just call in the native and mix it in with our OpenGL-based game. Um, 
And it, we really should have did that from the start. So I think, yeah, this video is ending. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time for this one, but out of curiosity, how many of you have used JavaScript profilers? Okay, well, okay, yeah, good. It's a pretty good number. Um, so basically, as part of the talk, I was just going to talk about how we also have a JavaScript profiler in the AppCellary ecosystem. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's a great tool. So, but we have this hybrid thing where we have both um, JavaScript and native code. So we're actually able to leverage both worlds. So this is the AppCellerator um, one. But we can also use um, Android, uh, DDMS, or Monitor. And we can see the different threads going on and where our hotspots are. And then we can also use Xcode. And Xcode has you know, lots of nice stuff. <laughs> so um, yeah, just really a wealth of different tools. And so we were able to use them to track down some very interesting um, performance bottlenecks in our code. And that was kind of the fun thing about native is we didn't have to stop at just where the JavaScript profiler told us where to stop. Um, so I wanted to kind of conclude this talk with uh, this last point where JavaScript actually beats native. So the, all, all this talk up to this point has been, you know, why native, why is native better? But that's not the full story because we're using JavaScript because we actually think it's better in many cases. So let me talk about one, live coding. So I think you guys, I think intuitively, already know what live coding is. Um, if you haven't heard the term before, um, it's basically changing your code as the app's running. So a weaker form of this is you hit the refresh button in your browser. A stronger form of it is that you don't even hit the refresh button, you just make changes and something automatically detects the change and it just dynamically appears in the web browser. And that is really powerful. And native development still doesn't get that. We have these really slow recompile, rebuild, relaunch cycles, we lost our place. Um, it takes forever to attach to a device. Um, and it's just, it's a really poor development experience. Um, so games um, have been embracing this. So they've been uh, basically now with Zynga, particularly in Farmville, is a really good example. They push out the game and then they make changes to it. So no longer do you have this three to five year development cycle and then ship your game and pray it sells. You ship the game first and then you make changes based upon what your, your audience is doing. And then you can also do interesting things in addition to like new levels and content. You can also do A-B split testing where you push out different levels to different people, see which ones are doing better, and then you uh, make ch uh, decisions based upon um, your results. And it's probably no uh, coincidence that Zynga and Farmville have a Flash JavaScript background instead of a native background because uh, native developers don't really, I think, understand this. But yeah, scripting languages are ideal. So you know, Lua started as a data description language and JavaScript brought us JSON. So I mean, they really understand this stuff. So I wanted to do a really cool demo using one of our game things. The logistics fell out at the very end. So I have a replacement here. Um, it's not as cool, but it still gets the point across. AppCelerator has technology called LiveView and basically allows you to make changes to the app while it's running. So in this case, they're doing GUIs. Um, um, native GUIs, and they're um, adding things to a list view. Um, so they have a simulator running on the right, and um, basically they're changing um, stuff in the code. And let me start the movie. So now they're just going to add a bunch of, I think, cells to the table. And you know, as the app is running, um, it just kind of, uh, oh, detected a change, and then push, and then um, uh, dynamically updates the GUI. Uh, no uh, rebuild, recycle, relaunch uh, cycle needed. So yeah, you guys already know this and you expect this. Um, native do not. So one of the things we're very interested in is bringing back the best ideas of JavaScript as well and bringing them to native. So now we get the best of both worlds. We get the performance, we get the features, and we also get the really smart ideas that are in JavaScript. So thank you. Um, So I get an achievement for that, and I think I get an achievement for this. Uh, most uh, mentions of Lua in an HTML5 talk ever. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we have free stuff. We have a booth, and I think we're giving out free uh, prizes. So if anybody has any questions. So yeah, um, and yeah, questions. Um, and I guess best question gets uh, free things. Yeah, get a, okay. get a free subscription <laughs> to the uh, Lanica platform. 
Sure. So for your, um, your physics engine demo, David, mm -hmm. Um, that one was actually the iOS simulator, uh, just because it was the easiest to capture movie. But yeah, we're, we we've got it works on iOS and Android right now. Uh, if I want to do some kind of extension to get some native uh, access, can I do that? Uh, can I do extensions in your platform? Um, yes. Yeah, so we're actually an extension to the AppCellular um, platform. So we're actually a plugin, and they have a formal um, plugin architecture. So you would just write to um, AppCellular's plugin um, stuff. Yeah. When you played that audio file, what was that? Was that just like a bunch of set time out functions with what file? Um, yeah, so it was, um, they preloaded a bunch of MP3s uh, of individual piano notes. And then he had, a, I think, a command sequence to um, play each note at a certain time with a set interval callback. You were using your library between a native app versus a browser app. Does it, is it accessed differently, or is it all accessed via JavaScript? So, um, yeah, so our technology actually was not designed to run in a web browser. So we actually made a hard choice to basically say, we well, know we want to do all native. So um, you actually build a native app that runs um, on iOS and Android. And yeah, right now, we um, just haven't focused on, on the web browser, partly because I think there's already a lot of people have tried that, but one thing I didn't really talk about was monetization. And nobody's making money in HTML5 games for the most part, unless you're on Facebook and Zynga. So it seems kind of inappropriate to use set timeout for playing audio because HTML5 has a high performance HTML5 audio API that does low latency scheduling and so forth. Okay. Um, no, so like I said, I'm not a huge expert in HTML5 audio, so this was Microsoft's MSDN uh, uh, example of HTML5 audio, and I, as far as I could see, yeah, they were not using um, this. Okay, there's a new one. Okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. so uh, I guess, how do you guys handle, uh, let's say, different screen layouts? Uh, let's say I'm doing my game, mm -hmm. and I'm on iPhone 5. Mm -hmm. And then want to play it on iPhone, uh, like 4S, and then on Android. So they all have different screen aspects. Do you have, uh, uh, I guess, uh, stuff to handle that, or do I have to handle that somehow? Um, it's a little semi-automatic, semi-manual. Um, so we have some mechanisms that deal with that. So when you set up like our OpenGL view, we you know we can automatically scale it, and then I think we have APIs that allow you to set aspect ratios and things like that. So um, you may find that you still want to tweak it, um, but then there's the native side. Since we are kind of in a plug-in to the native side, you also have to deal with the native side, especially when you want to deal with native UI. And so um, Apple Cellular also has some mechanisms to deal with the native UI, but what we've actually found sometimes is like, particularly iPad, um, the native widgets really actually have two completely different UI models, and you actually want to do special cases for the iPad versus the iPhone. That part we can't do automatically for you. But we do, we do try to help, and we do have, I think, uh, some documents on um, how you can address this. But for gaming also, we, we can detect the 2x and the 3x, depending on the resolution for iOS. But we can explain. Yeah, we're looking. Yeah, we're looking at that, and then we do a scale, and then we figure out what that is. But we also take that and we do it on Android as well. Okay. Yeah, so that you can actually have one. You know, you can do three different sets of images, right? And then it will scale. Choose the one that is appropriately scaled to your device. And then we extend that to Android, so you will get the same kind of a feel on over an Android. That sounded like a good question. <laughs> Give away. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, oh slide. Uh, I guess we'll probably put the slides up at some point. Um, but yeah, they're not up yet, but um, send, send me an email. I can get you slides or whatever. Yeah. I put the plus HTML5 to possibly weed out uh, hate mail. General question: You mentioned in passing a data-oriented design um, as opposed to object-oriented design. Any resources you would recommend to get uh, a bit more knowledge about that? Um, yeah. So actually, there's quite a few uh, resources. Um, some of them are actually footnoted in my uh, talk, but there's actually a lot more. 
but uh, you pretty much your Google talk or a Google search will basically hit um, pretty much all of them. Um, there's there it's pretty easy to find. You put in data oriented design, you'll you'll get a lot of hits. Yeah, don't look at the C++ books. <laughs> yeah, so C++ and uh, oh, data oriented design they're, different. they're they're not mutually exclusive, but uh, a lot of C++ people don't like it. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, so the native side of it, so we actually used an open source engine uh, that was already written for us. Um, the, our, our challenge was um, embedding it so it works, it's callable through JavaScript. Um, so the, um, it's a real C library, so um, you compile it, um, it creates a binary, and you know, for every architecture, so, um, and for every you know, Android on iOS, we have to recompile it. Um, but yeah, they were the same code bases on Android and iOS. But the native for um, They were actually not exactly the same. So that's why this wasn't a rigorous benchmark, but uh, they were pretty close, uh, close enough for at least these magnitudes. It, um, um, they, you wouldn't want to do like this library versus this library type thing, because yeah, it's not a good comparison there, but just magnitudes of performance, because it's really in a physics engine, you're doing these prefetched arrays, you're doing a lot of math, um, on, okay, transform this verte vertex, but you got an array of ver vertices. Um, and so that's where you really get your be um, benefit. Great, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, well, thank you.